This program is brought to you by the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii, a nonprofit organization dedicated to sharing with the community the many benefits of a vegetarian diet. Free monthly meetings include vegetarian experts found locally and on the mainland, quick and easy cooking demonstrations, and healthful and delicious food samples. Members enjoy an informative quarterly newsletter, social activities, and discounts at many vegetarian-friendly restaurants and health food stores. For an application, call 944-8344. That's 944-8344. Or visit our website at www.vsh.org. vsh.org. Well, I'd like to welcome you all to the monthly meeting of the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii. The Vegetarian Society is a not-for-profit volunteer organization founded in 1990 for the purpose of promoting human health, animal rights, and protection of the environment by means of vegetarian education. We are among the largest vegetarian societies in the country with over 2,000 members. We also would like to invite you to join our ranks as a volunteer. We have a variety of interesting and challenging and important volunteer jobs available, some long-term, some short-term. And if you are interested in learning more about how your interest and skills can match our needs, Patrick over there, let's see what happened to Patrick. There he is, he's in the back. That Patrick is our volunteer coordinator. Please see him after the lecture or any other board member who's here tonight. Uh, Bill, Dr. Bill Harris behind the camera is a board member. Uh, let's see, Carl, Dr. Seth in the back waving his hand is a board member. Do we have any other board members present tonight? So we hope that some of you will be interested. We have a very small volunteer team. We have over 2,000 members, as I mentioned. We have about 10 volunteers. And most of these people have been doing what they're doing for since 1990. And, you know, we're not getting any younger. We're just as devoted and dedicated to the cause. But we really need new ideas, new people, and people to take the torch and move us into the next decade or so. So please know that our ranks are wide open and we welcome anyone with an interest and with the skills that we need. Tonight's lecture will be videotaped for broadcast on the VSH weekly TV series entitled Vegetarian. On Oahu, it airs on Thursdays at 6 p.m. on Olelo Channel 52. We suggest that you set your VCR to record the show because if you do like it and want to share it or see it again, that will be your only opportunity. Sometimes the shows will air again, but we don't know in advance, and it's not guaranteed. We don't have access to copies. So if you tape it, you'll have it. And if you don't want to keep it, you just tape over it for the next time. That's what we recommend and hope you will do. It's now time for our special guest. We're delighted to have with us public health attorney Michelle Simon, Ms. Simon has published numerous articles about such issues as the National School Lunch Program, the Dietary Guidelines, and Corporate Lobbying. She lectures extensively and teaches health policy at the University of California, Hastings College of Law, where she received her law degree. She earned her master's degree in public health at Yale. Tonight, she will discuss her new book, Appetite for Profit, how the Food Industry Undermines Our Health. Please welcome Michelle Simon. Oh, thank you so much. Oh, wow, another way. Thank you. Thank you. So nice. Thank you. It's uh, first pretty rare to uh, get this kind of welcome and uh, it's a thrill for me to be here and thank you so much for coming and thank you to the Vegetarian Society and you know I come from the San Francisco Bay Area where the Hawaii Vegetarian Society is actually the reputation precedes you and we're quite jealous of having uh, is that better okay you can hear me now we're quite jealous over in San Francisco of all places that you all have 2,000 members that's that's quite amazing and um, I think in the Bay Area, it's sort of taken for granted. I'm really thrilled to be here, and definitely, by far, this has been the best gig, shall we say, as a book author. Um, I think that's pretty obvious, and 
my partner was able to come over with me and um, somehow he didn't come with me when I went to Baltimore last month or Traverse City, Michigan. He skipped that one um, where I got trapped for two days. So it's been really nice. We had a few extra days on Maui and I'm really thrilled to be with you tonight. So what I want to do is keep this pretty informal. Um, I do want to tell you about my book, but before I do that, I want to give you a little bit of a background and kind of how I got to this place because it really um, was a journey for me and, of course, it continues. So I um, found out about this thing called the vegetarian diet back in 1995. I was graduating from law school at the time, had been struggling with my weight, and um, somebody introduced me to Dean Ornish's book, Eat More, Way Less. And um, this is a book you might be familiar with in which Dean Ornish found that by putting his patients on a vegetarian diet, they were able to not only stop but reverse heart disease, and in the process, they lost weight. And this was a new concept to me, and so I thought, I'll try that. And lo and behold, I lost 30 pounds in the first six months of adopting um, his recommendation for eating. And that really got my attention, because by that time, I had already had my public health degree. And I'm sorry to say that I learned nothing about nutrition at the Yale School of Public Health. Yes, um, and it's probably a good thing, I know. So that set me on a path of trying to learn more, and I basically got every book I could get my hands on and, and read more, and of course read John Robbins' book, and at the end of that journey, I called up EarthSave, which wasn't too far from me, in Santa Cruz, and said, do you guys need a lawyer? And they didn't know what I was talking about, thought it was crazy, and... So I looked around for other opportunities, and as it happened, EarthSave at that time had a Bay Area chapter. And so I went and volunteered, and I just showed up one day, and I said, I want on board, I want to become a vegetarian activist, because I need to tell the rest of the world about all these amazing benefits of, of eating this way. So that kind of um, set that path in motion, but that wasn't enough for me. And I wanted to really apply my educational background to this issue, and I kind of looked around at who else was talking about this topic, and I saw a lot of wonderful health experts, I'm sure you've, you've had them here, John McDougall, Neil Barnard, talking about the medical, the health aspects of eating this way, but there was no one I could see who really were, was getting at the underlying policy issues, the corporate influence over our food policy, over our food choices. You know, it's really no accident, as it turns out, that meat and dairy products have become the center of the American diet. And so I started looking into that aspect of the issue, realizing that this is a story that needed to be told. And so I um, kind of created my own little subspecialty of nutrition policy, the politics of food, and started writing, research and writing articles about what I call the politics of meat and dairy at that time, and looked into the National School Lunch Program and the influence of the um, meat and dairy industries over that, and discovered, um, this is now in the late 90s, the work of Marion Nessel. And so I like to say that um, I was a fan of Marion Nessel's before she became famous, because her book didn't come out for a few more years. And um, she was really the first one to shine a light on how, in particular, the meat and dairy industries were influencing the dietary guidelines. And if you haven't read it yet, I highly recommend her book, Food Politics, at least the several chapters in which she does highlight this corporate influence over, over a government nutrition policy. So for several years, I was sort of helping um, to get that word out and doing a little bit more um, sort of focused work on that um, side of the picture. And then um, for a short time, I actually worked for Neil Barnard um, from California as a lawyer. I was, I'm proud to say I'm the first lawyer that Neil Bar Barnard ever hired, and now PCRM in D.C. has a full-fledged staff of lawyers who do wonderful work, and I still um, do work with them informally. And then, um, you know, I guess I get a little restless, so at some point I decided to start my own nonprofit in um, 2000. And if you're considering doing something like that, and it's really hard uh, to run your own nonprofit to raise money, et cetera, I don't recommend that um, as a path. But I tried it and um, have done that for a few years and wound up really doing more consulting work. But what I want to get to is how I kind of transitioned from focusing on kind of the meat and dairy industries to the food industry in general. Because at some point, it kind of dawned on me that this problem that we have with our food supply isn't really specific to just meat and dairy, right? That's just a really bad aspect of it. But of course, there's politics in sugar and lots of non-animal product um, types of foods. And really, the underlying problem is the entire industrialized food system. I actually, on a personal level, made a transition from eating 
a, a vegan diet to a whole foods vegan diet um, in about 2000, uh, I think, where I, when I did a fast. So I had another sort of awakening moment when I realized I, even though I was not eating meat and dairy products, was really eating too many processed foods. So in my nonprofit, I decided to really um, advocate for eating a whole foods plant-based diet. And that really kind of led me down this more broad, this broader path of talking about the politics of food. Then what happened to kind of lead me to writing this book was that, you know, those of us who've been talking about these issues for, for years and whining and complaining about them, um, the rest of the world kind of caught up to us, right, in about 2002. And what happened then was the uh, Surgeon General's report came out, actually at the very end of 2001, in which the federal government figured out, lo and behold, that two-thirds of Americans are overweight and one-third obese, and, oh my God, we have a public health crisis on our hands that we now call obesity, right? The rest of us knew that this was a problem, didn't necessarily call it obesity. We were, you know, been concerned about heart disease and all the other um, awful chronic illnesses and, of course, environmental destruction, you name it, that is related to our um, industrialized food system, mainly um, animal-based products. But the media kind of woke up policymakers started to realize we had a problem on our hands and um, that's when the issue really started to get interesting for me. <laughs> I was attending an a event hosted by ABC News and Time Magazine. This is now 2004. So, you know, the issue is really heating up because people are starting to ask the question, you know, how did this happen? How is it that two-thirds of Americans are overweight? Why do we have a childhood obesity epidemic on our hands? Well, Time Magazine and ABC News decided they were going to try and forge solutions to the obesity epidemic. And so they held this summit on obesity in 2004. And I went. It was in Williamsburg, Virginia. And um, giving the keynote address at that time was former Secretary of Health and Human Services, Tommy Thompson. So I was attending this event, uh, Williamsburg, Virginia, summit on obesity, giving the keynote address was the former Secretary of Health and Human Services, Tommy Thompson, a man who knew nothing about public health, but he was a good cheerleader, and he was there giving his rah-rah speech, and he said that um, the major food companies were on board trying to solve this problem, right, that they were helping, exactly. Well, unfortunately, not enough people in the audience laughed, but there he was claiming that the major food companies were on board, and the, one of the companies that he mentioned along these lines was Coca-Cola. <laughs> right. See, you guys already get it. But the audience there didn't get it until um, a funny thing happened during the Q&A period. And the, uh, a representative from the state of Indiana, a man by the t name of Charles Brown, got up and he wanted to know from Tommy Thompson, if Coca-Cola was such a responsible company, then why had they sent five lobbyists to his state capitol to kill his bill that would have required only half of all school beverages sold in school vending machines to be healthy. Well, Tommy Thompson didn't have a very good answer for that. He just kind of said, well, I don't know anything about that, but if it happens again, you call me. Oh, yeah. Right, that's what I said. So that was when I realized, wow, there's a story to tell. This kind of got me mad because I realized here was this hypocrisy going on, right? We have on one hand the nation's top health official telling people that Coca-Cola and friends were on board solving this problem. But the reality on the ground was far different. Here was this local politician finding himself on the receiving end of some heavy-duty lobbying from this same company. So I figured he couldn't be the only one. Well, upon further research, it turned out he wasn't the only one. And there were many, many other stories just like this. And that was when I decided I had to tell these stories. I had to get this word out. I had to expose this hypocrisy. And that's the essential thesis of the book, that on one hand, the food companies are claiming to be part of the solution and doing somersaults to be claiming that they've changed their ways, that they've got it covered, but the reality is far different. So what I want to do now is just kind of take you through um, kind of what I call my little map of uh, my analysis of what's going on. So I'm going to um, write on the board a little bit and hopefully not break any wires. I'm going to get out of the way in a minute. So if you think about big food, obviously we can talk about big food in a number of different ways, right? Different companies. I happen to have chosen the top branded corporations to highlight in my book. So these are companies that you've all heard of. Coca-Cola, Kraft Foods, General Mills, 
McDonald's on the fast food side. I wanted to go further than just talking about fast food because the problem, of course, is uh, processed foods in general. These are the companies I chose to highlight are really the ones that are putting themselves out there as being the good guys. So there are some companies, you know, that are being more quiet. I'm not as interested in them. Um, so I really focused on, on these major corporations. And then the other um, players in this whole controversy are the trade groups. So these are the major national associations that, that these companies are represented by. So of course the food companies pool their resources in these trade groups and they let the trade groups do the lobbying for the most part. And then there's another category that's important to understand which are the front groups. Okay, so these are the um, organizations, the best example of which is the Center for Consumer Freedom. And Center for Consumer Freedom, anybody heard of them? Okay, well I highly recommend taking a gander on their website because they um, attack groups that you might know and love like PCRM, like PETA, because they don't, they don't like anyone who takes a swipe at the food industry and the meat industry in particular. And so the Center for Consum Consumer Freedom is a front group. Why? Because it sounds good, right? Who could be against consumers and freedom? That's the American way. And that's what they're trying to fool you with. But the reality is they are funded by the food industry. They were actually started with the grant from Philip Morris, so that certainly gives you an idea of what they're about. So it's, an import, it's important when you think about the food industry to understand that it's not just the branded companies that you've heard about, but a whole other cadre of groups kind of working behind the scenes. And those are the types of groups that I expose in the book. So they're in the middle of this controversy, right? And you have to think about what's going on right now in the nation as this kind of swirling controversy, a lot of questions being asked, you know, how did we get here? How do we fix this problem? And the food companies finally are finding themselves on the receiving end of a lot of criticism. So they're feeling heat from a number of sources, and that's what these arrows represent. And I'm not going to write all these down because I have terrible handwriting, but just so you understand, the arrows are pressure points, right, that the food industry is feeling from various sources. So one pressure point is the media. Of course, the media is really finally woken up, really writing about these issues. Another pressure point is scientists, right? Almost every week there's another report out about how soda causes diabetes or how um, meat eating, again, causes heart disease, etc. So uh, science is another pressure point. Advocates like myself screaming about something needs to be done. Um, policymakers, believe it or not, the local level, of course, not the federal government. The federal government is completely um, asleep at the wheel. But the policymaking has shifted to the state and local levels where folks like uh, the representative from Indiana. So the different pressure points, right? Media, the science, the, uh, the policymakers. So industry is under a lot of pressure. But they also have to worry about two things, um, and they both relate to this. <laughs> so I have a whole chapter in the book that explains how corporations operate, right? Their modus operandi is for one reason, and all, all of everything they do goes to money making. I mean, it, it sounds obvious, but I really felt like I had to explain in detail how this works. And the reason that's important is because too many people like to think that corporations can just do the right thing. Why can't they change their ways? Well, they're obligated to their shareholders. There is no way around that. First and foremost, they have to worry about making money for their shareholders. So they're always under that pressure. So that's the side pressure. The other side pressure is competition, right? So if McDonald's makes a change, then they have to worry about Burger King swooping in and taking up any of the profits that they might lose from whatever change they make. Okay, so they're always under that pressure. So if you think about it, these four food companies are kind of between a rock and a hard place, right? Because they're under all this pressure to change their ways, to do the right thing, but they still have to make money. And food companies make money how? By processing food, right? I mean, they're not, McDonald's isn't going to start selling organic salads. It's just not what they do, right? They make burgers and fries and shakes and soda. That's how they make money. So that's a lot of what I talk about in the book, to explain this basic principle. So that also will explain the various responses and why, when the companies are responding and when they say that they're doing the right thing, it doesn't quite ring true. So what I do is I um, analyze the number of different ways that the food companies and their trade groups are responding. And, you know, these fall into some basic categories that anyone who might feel like they're being accused of something might respond. So, for example, you could deny 
that there's a problem, and that's certainly a tactic that a lot of the um, trade groups are taking. Mostly, this is a strategy by the front group. So I mentioned Center for Consumer Freedom. They've taken out full-page ads in the Wall Street Journal or Washington Post saying that obesity is hype, right? And where did they get this concept from, this denial tactic? The tobacco industry, right, who for decades denied that there was any connection between cigarette smoking and lung cancer. So certain uh, sectors of the food industry, namely the front groups, are taking this tack. Now, the branded food companies who worry more about public relations aren't really so interested in denying that there's a problem because it's, it's really the evidence is so overwhelming that it's too embarrassing for them to do that. So instead, but don't worry, they've got plenty of other tricks up their sleeve. So instead of denial, the major food companies are really looking at making excuses. Okay, all right, so maybe we have a little bit of a public health crisis on our hands, but really it's not our fault food industry that spends $36 billion a year on marketing. No. Whose fault is it? It's your fault, Americans. You're a bunch of, you know, what? Lazy duffs, right? Um, you need to get out and do what? Exercise. Okay, so now exercise has become this great way to deflect attention from what the food companies are doing. Now, I don't have a problem with exercise. I do have a problem when food companies use it as an excuse and use it as a way to not, pay, to not look over here. And that's exactly what's going on. And this is playing out in a number of ways, most nefariously by the major food companies that are funneling uh, money and educational programs into our school system. So we have PepsiCo, Coca-Cola, McDonald's with these um, branded educational curricula promoting exercise in elementary schools, middle schools, and high schools all over this country. To me, this is extremely troubling because what in the world is Coca-Cola doing educating our kids about health? But that's what's going on. So, so we have denial, excuses, and then another major response that I analyze in two chapters is under this heading I call neutral washing. So you remember how in the environmental movement we had greenwashing right, based on whitewashing, so this idea of companies pretending to be changing their ways but really not. So now we have the major food companies doing the same thing in uh, two different categories, we have the fast food industry, mostly represented by McDonald's, and I do pick on them, and rightly so, they make themselves a good target, claiming now to be making salads. So what does McDonald's call a salad? Well, luckily, my friends at PCRM actually did the nutrition analysis to show that, lo and behold, some of their salads have more calories and fat than a Big Mac. So, obviously, calling something a salad does not exactly make it healthy, okay? And this is the kind of consumer deception that's going on. Same thing going on on the packaged food side. My favorite example being the cereal company General Mills, right, which makes all those unbelievably processed sugary cereals aimed at children. General Mills decided they were going to take advantage of the dietary guidelines back in 2005 that came out and told Americans we need to be eating more whole grains, right? Because the processed food companies strip all the whole grains from the foods. And so the uh, federal government said, well, gosh, golly gee, why are Americans not getting so many enough whole grains? Well, you know, a company like General Mills doesn't miss a beat. What do they do? They plaster all their boxes with the label whole grain, right? Could not realize, I mean, not caring that what the message to eat whole grains means is to eat natural whole grains, right? Whole grain breads, brown rice, no, no, no. General Mills says, it's okay, we're going to put the label whole grain on Lucky Charms, on Cocoa Puffs, and my personal favorite, now we have whole grain Reese's Puff cereal. Great for kids. Now moms, don't worry, your kids too can have whole grains. You're looking at me like I'm crazy, I swear to God, go to the supermarket, you'll see it. <laughs> So this is the kind of thing that's going on across the board, and I felt like it was really important to expose this. So this is the category of claiming to be changing their ways, but obviously it's just the same old junk food dressed up with new labeling. And, and then the last response that I go into detail about is the lobbying. Okay, so we have, on one hand, the food companies claiming to be changing their ways, obviously not really doing so, all the while behind the scenes, it's basically business as usual, right? Doing what food companies and any industry, frankly, does best, which is lobbying against any actual government policies for moving forward. So all of the, the um, first category that I mentioned, the earlier categories, 
are really strategies to keep government away from industry business, right? So at all costs, industry does not want government to regulate what it does. So if a company says, we're changing our ways on our own, then government regulators think that they've got the problem solved. But when government regulators actually start to interfere with corporate businesses and actually try to put laws into place, oh, no, no, no. The corporations aren't going to have any of that. So they're lobbying tooth and nail to stop any of that kind of policy making from moving forward. And we're seeing this play out in a number of ways. And I thought it was really critical to expose this because, as I mentioned earlier, the policy making, most people think policy making just happens in Washington, D.C. Well, there's a lot of policy making now, especially on this topic, that has moved to the state level. And it's very hard for most reporters, of course, to be um, following what's going on at every state legislature. So that's why I decided I had to follow it and expose it. And it's particularly nefarious with the schools. So because of the emphasis on children, because so much of the focus on this problem has been on children, and rightly so, and because the state of school food is so dismal, many states have taken up this issue, and many local school districts have taken up this issue of trying to improve school food. Well, unfortunately, that effort's not going very well, in large part thanks to the heavy-duty lobbying by companies like Coca-Cola, as I mentioned earlier, and the trade associations to stop any legislation from passing in states all over this country. So I give many more examples of that in the book. Another type of policy that's being thwarted is this idea of having nutrition labeling in fast food restaurants, right? Just like we have nutrition labeling on uh, packaged foods sold in the grocery stores, why don't we have nutrition labeling not in every mom and pop restaurant, but in the chain restaurants, 10 outlets or more, where these companies know darn well what is in their food, right? Why shouldn't we have that? When most Americans, and I know maybe not most of you here, but the truth is, the sad truth is, most Americans are eating in these places and they deserve to have the information available. The restaurant industry does not want that information made available. Just simple information like calories, fat, just even one or two numbers, they will fight and have successfully fought every state effort to get a bill like that passed. So on the school side, we've had a few states that have been successful. With the nutrition labeling in restaurants, not one state has been able to get this passed thanks to the lobbying by the restaurant industry. So I talk about that. And then the final area of lobbying has to do with the food industry not wanting consumers to be able to sue them. So remember with Big Tobacco, litigation became a very important strategy to hold the tobacco industry accountable for its deception. Well, of course, the food industry doesn't want to go down that road. And so in order to stop it before it even starts, they're passing laws, and now they've been successful in 26 states, to stop people's ability, your consumer rights to sue the food industry. And this is very troubling because we don't know. We really don't know what the food industry knows and when they knew it about what's, you know, about what's in the food because, again, in restaurants, they're not telling us and also um, how they've deceptively marketed the food. So to sue the food industry doesn't mean blaming McDonald's for making you fat, which a lot of people think it's about. No, it has to do with how the food company markets the products, right? And McDonald's, believe it or not, maybe not so much anymore, but used to market the cheeseburgers and french fries as good for you, okay? And that's what, there's only been one case, one case that's been filed, and that's what it's about. And it's in New York State, and it's still pending. So the court in that state has not, um, has found that there's enough evidence to move forward. And that's what's scaring the food industry to death. So, again, it's still at the very early stages. We don't know if litigation will be as successful as it has been in tobacco. But I certainly think it's important enough to keep that door open. And that's why I thought it was important to have a chapter on that. But, you know, I didn't want to just have the gloom and doom. And I know it's sounding very depressing now. But um, really what part of my motivation for writing this book, in addition to exposing all of this hypocrisy and nefarious lobbying and all these awful things, 
was to help people, was to give people practical tools and resources for how to fight back. So throughout the book, I have tips, for example, on how to read a press release. Right? You have to actually read the press release. That's step number one. Because the media, unfortunately, does not do a very good job of actually describing the details of what's going on. So there are simple ways to deconstruct what a food company says, to not believe McDonald's when they say, for example, we're no longer supersizing. Right? That's something we heard a couple of years ago. But if you just look underneath the surface, it turns out, well, sure, they're not making the 8-ounce fries, but they're still making the 7-ounce fries. Okay? So you know, it's, a lot of it's just that simple, just a name game. I don't consider myself an investigative journalist. I just pay close attention. And anyone can really do that if you just take the time. So I give tips on that. And then I have many resources in the back of the book uh, that have appendices on how to get a bill passed, things that are really more geared towards people who want to jump in as an activist. And then I give a guide to the front group so you know who these folks are. So when you hear the American Council on Fitness and Nutrition, which, wow, that sounds good, could be a government agency, right? Well, no, it turns out they are completely funded by Kraft, Coca-Cola, et al. So I have that in the book. And then a list of the, what I call the good guys, right? To really give people um, ideas for how to get involved. And the good news is, there are so many groups all over this country, in addition to this one, that are working to change the system. And I've been at conferences all over the country where these people gather, and I always encourage vegetarian groups to look for those uh, linkages, for example, with the sustainable agriculture movement. There are so many people out there that are working on different pieces of the puzzle, and I think if we all looked for ways to work together, we could be a lot stronger. So th that's definitely the good news. A lot of great stuff happening. And I think with that, I will take a breath and take your questions. Yes. Thank you. Oh, there's a question back here. I'm sorry, the lot, say again. Are the lobbyists and the front groups yeah. liable yeah, okay. So are the um, lobbyists and the front groups liable for misinformation? So what extent do the uh, trade groups... Well, I think it depends. I mean, if we're talking about, obviously, just marketing related to food packages, I mean, that's the individual companies that are deceptively marketing their products. If we're talking about certain statements that um, come out of the trade associations themselves, and I do, I, I talk about this one phrase, for example, that somehow started to get picked up by various members of both the executives in the food companies and the trade association representatives. And that was this idea of energy balance. So um, it's very funny to me that, you know, all these industry folks started talking about energy balance, energy balance, because they wanted to get away from this idea of food marketing or taking in too many calories. So that, I do think, I don't know if they had a meeting. You know, it looked to me like somehow they all kind of got on the same page with talking about this idea of energy balance, and that's a way of simplifying the whole thing, right? It's just calories in, calories out, and so we can talk about exercise and all of that. I think when these uh, trade groups do make statements like that, then yes, does that make them legally liable for anything? Probably not. I'll give you another example, though, of, of deceptive statements by trade groups. Uh, the National Restaurant Association and their state affiliates are the ones really behind this lobbying campaign to stop consumer access to the courtroom. This boggled my mind. I was following uh, this piece of legislation in the state of Minnesota. And I read an article that talked about how, and this is very common, this rhetoric that there have been just this onslaught of lawsuits against the food industry. And this is rhetoric that's coming out of these trade groups to justify the passage of these laws that, you know, these poor mom and pop restaurants are getting sued. I mean, none of this is true. So I, so I saw this reference in uh, Minnesota that said, in an article that said 10 lawsuits have been filed on obesity against the food industry, and I knew for sure that wasn't true. And so I emailed the reporter and I said, where did you get, you know, I played innocent. I said, gee, I'm writing about this stuff too. What's your source for that piece of data? And he said, oh, I don't know. I got it from this politician. So of course, this politician was a puppet of the restaurant industry because I contacted him and said, so where did you get this data? And he didn't know. So basically the 
industry trade groups are putting up these, you know, these politicians to do their dirty work and feeding them this misinformation. Again, I mean, it's dirty politics, for sure. It, it's lying, for sure. And that's why I wanted to expose it, but not necessarily legally actionable, as my litigator friends might say. You have to have a cause of action. You have to have some damages. I mean, there's a lot of elements to bringing a lawsuit. And so if someone lies and someone's reputation is harmed or somebody, you know, I mean, bad policy making and lying, you know, that's sort of the American way. I mean, so you know, <laughs> I'm not saying it's okay and I'm not justifying it. I'm just saying there's no obvious way to bring a lawsuit. I mean, you know, the courtroom has its limitations as a policy solution. We need other solutions to that problem. We need a better political process, a cleaner political process. You know, we, there are lots of other ways to go about this problem of, of lying and policy making or, you know, deception and, and getting this information out there. But I'm not sure that the courtroom is, is the right place. What about if they, do they really put stuff in the food that makes you crave it? Uh, the question was, do they put stuff in the food that makes you crave it? Well, it's interesting. Uh, there's, I think, a lot of, what do I say? To me, what that's asking about is, um, is food addictive? And is there kind of a deliberate attempt by food companies to make foods addictive? And there's a lot of controversy right now. I don't think there's enough debate going on. Let's put it that way. I think we need to be asking those questions a lot harder of the food industry. The problem is, of course, we need, just like in big tobacco, we, you know, we got a lot of documents that exposed what the tobacco industry was doing. We don't have the same opportunity yet with the food industry to get at, you know, what are these companies doing? What are they putting in these foods that could potentially uh, make the foods more addictive? I will say we have um, scientific evidence of certain aspects of food that are addicting. So sugar being the most obvious one. And there's plenty of scientific evidence to show that sugar is addictive. Rat studies have been done. The brain studies have been done to show how the certain parts of the brain that light up the same way they do with cocaine. So, and there's um, definitely a connection I'm learning now because I'm working on alcohol issues as well, that there is a connection between alcoholism and um, sugar craving. And it makes sense because it's all sugar. So I, don't, I can't say for sure if food companies are doing this on purpose. There was um, a series of interesting articles in the, I think it was the Chicago Tribune, uh, because Kraft Foods is uh, based in Illinois. And they talked about some Kraft scientists that kind of knew a bit about um, sugar being addictive. You know, Kraft used to be owned by Philip Morris, the tobacco company. Unfortunately, they spun off Kraft a few months ago, so I don't get to you know, make as much fun of that connection, um, but obviously the history is still there. So I think that's still an unanswered question, and it's certainly one that interests me, and I'm hoping that we'll have some more um, research and investigation of that. But my understanding is in the kind of the research world, it's sort of this scary topic that a lot of people don't want to go to. And of course, a lot of the food-related research is funded by industry. So you have that um, ongoing problem of, um, you know, nutrition research in general, um, not completely, but at least partly being obscured by um, the funding source. Ah, lots of questions. Um, Go ahead. Yeah. 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 Uh, I haven't read your book yet, so I don't know what the contents are, but you mentioned that uh, Advertising is a tax-deductible business expense, number one. And secondly, by way of comment and question, the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii spent several years battling to get a vegetarian school option available. And in that process, I found out why it is so very difficult to make any changes in the national school lunch program, and that is because the USDA is calling the shots. Right. The USDA has complete control over what food is fed to the kids, and I wonder if you mentioned the USDA's role in all of that. Yeah, well, that's definitely something I've written about in the past, and there's no question that um, it can be difficult to get changes made, but the truth is that there are changes being made. So it's not to say, well, just because USDA calls the shots, I mean, they certainly regulate the nutrition, what 
types of uh, nutrition has to be, what standards have to be met. But there are many examples of schools that have worked within those guidelines to have plant-based options. So it can be done. It's just very challenging. And unfortunately, it can be challenging for a lot of schools to do it economically. You know, I can point you to plenty of resources. Antonia Demas, who's based in upstate New York, has a wonderful curriculum called Food is Elementary, in which she shows exactly what I just said, which is how you can have plant-based menu options in schools that meet the USDA dietary guidelines. So there, and there are wonderful farm-to-school programs that get salad bars into schools where they use fresh local produce. So, I mean, I'm not saying this is, you know, a revolution and it's happening everywhere, but I'm saying there are slow efforts to, to make those improvements. As to your first question, yes, advertising is a um, business expense deductible from corporate taxes. And I certainly think that it would be nice if that were not so. Uh, but try to go after that one in Congress and you'll have, you know, the weight of the political world on your shoulders. So that's a tough nut to crack. Yes. Yeah, it's, it's really hard to, to know um, where our food comes from. I mean, and that's really what you're talking about. So um, it's it's... You know, that's why what I try to do in California, and I'm lucky that I have farmer's markets, and I try to talk to my farmers and really know where my food comes from and basically avoid a lot of those types of foods that you're talking about. So, yes, I've heard of it. Right, right. So she was asking about the natural sweetener, stevia, and how uh, the sugar industry um, has had that concerted campaign against that sweetener getting out there. But interestingly, I just read something about Coca-Cola. Now, did anyone see this? It was in the news, I think, just this past week, that Coca-Cola is now kind of getting on the stevia bandwagon. And I'm not sure, I mean, I think they finally figured out that this is a very potent sweetener. I'm not sure they're going to replace high fructose corn syrup, which is the, the sweetener of choice now in processed foods and uh, sweetened beverages. But I did read that recently. I thought that was um, very interesting. So we'll see. I mean, we may see more of stevia um, on the market. But, yeah. So, yeah. Yes. Well, of course, I like to think of my home state of California as a leader. Um, he asked which states are leading the way. You know, the funny thing is about California, people think we're a leader, and, you know, in so many ways we are. But even there, it took six years to get any bill passed. This is specifically related to school nutrition, and I'm particularly talking about the um, vending machines, so the soda and the junk food sold through vending machines. It took six years to get any kind of bill passed, and when the bill did pass, it was significantly compromised. So the bill that did pass still allows Gatorade and other sweetened beverages in the schools, and that's very common. So I mentioned there's a handful of states. I think Colorado is another one. Connecticut took also four or five years talk about Connecticut in the book because they had this four-year battle mostly against Coca-Cola and they did finally get a bill through that's not bad but the problem is that nobody is really getting at the underlying problem with, at least when it comes to vending which is having any vending in school is a problem and so what's going on is people are just passing these bills that require certain nutrition standards. So we, ha so we have fights over, well, is our artificial sweeteners okay? And, and then, of course, if we're only talking about obesity, then, you know, the lawmakers think, well, Diet Coke must be fine because it doesn't make you fat, you know, not understanding anything about nutrition. And, of course, because we're too obsessed, I think, with obesity and not the holistic picture of health, um, we're having those kinds of policy outcomes. So it's really... But to answer your question more specifically, I will say um, Maine has actually been a real leader. And I have um, several stories about the state legislature who's been leading the charge in Maine and some of the lobbying he's come up against. And I think in some ways, because Maine is a small state, they're kind of able to, um, to be out there a little bit more. Um, I know there's been struggles in Hawaii around the school issue, and they too have come up against the lobbying. I don't have the specific you know, stories to tell about that in the book, but basically pretty much every state there is a story to tell about um, the lobbying so it's I will say um, on the positive side New York City and what's happening now is I mentioned the policy making going from federal to the state level well in New York City they've taken it to the local level so we've had some success with the local health department in New York City addressing trans fat Again, a kind of micro issue as far as I'm concerned, but a good example of local policymaking. So now um, all restaurants, 
um, will be required to no longer use trans fat. Similarly, they are requiring some of the chain restaurants to post nutrition information. So I think we can take some heart in other cities and states are actually following New York City's lead with trans fat. So um, I think we have the most hope, like usual, with policymaking at the local level. Yes? I see so many boxes with zero trans fat. Yes. And I turn around and it says partially hydrogenated this and that. What, right. What's that? <laughs> right. So that, right. So the trick there is that it can say um, on the front of the package zero grams of trans fat but still contain partially hydrogenated oils because the FDA, in its infinite wisdom, says that it's okay to do that as long as the uh, serving size is less than half a gram. Was that right? Or less, sorry, if the um, trans fat, oh, God, now I've forgotten what it is. What did half I say? Half a gram or less. Half a gram of less. Thank you. In a serving. Okay. So that's how they get away with it. If there's half a gram of less of trans fat in the serving of the product, then they can put zero trans fat on the front. So um, somebody was just reminding me of, of another expert who talks about how don't believe anything on the front of the package, and I definitely um, agree with that, that the only information that is really legally regulated is on the back, and that's the, the nutrition facts label and the ingredients. So definitely always look there, don't believe anything on the front. So the question was whether there are any specific chemical additives other than sugar um, that make foods addictive. Again, I don't, we don't know. I mean, you know, we know what most of the ingredients are um, based on what the companies have to say, but um, they can also say things like natural flavorings, and there are a lot of, you know, generalized terms they can use that don't get at the specific uh, chemicals that are used. I haven't heard of any, you know, smoking gun evidence of, of addictive chemicals, but to me... It really has more to do with the intense flavoring of the food. So the high salt, you know, every time you see these, the flaming hot Cheetos and all of this stuff that's put on the market that's so artificially flavored and so intensely flavored, that is, I think, um, changing our palates. So, you know, people talk about, you know, I don't like to eat salad or vegetables because they're so bland. Like, well, that's probably because you're eating too much highly processed food, which has kind of twisted your taste buds into wanting that intense flavor, which I think has some kind of addictive quality. And, and you know, the reason that we crave um, certain senses, like high-fat, high-salty foods, is because those were the foods that were scarce in the environment where we evolved. And so when we came upon them, our bodies are basically designed for famine. Right? So we need to stock up on calories when we can get them. You know, again, thinking about in the wild. And, of course, now we have this food environment that is completely the opposite, which is an overabundance of food with these intense flavors all the time. And so I think it's, I'm not so much worried about any nefarious chemicals that, you know, lab scientists are kind of figuring out. It's more just the artificial flavoring, the, the artificial intensity of the flavors. I mean, you know, McDonald's french fries, yeah, they use a ton of chemicals, most of them um, certainly for flavoring, for preservatives, for shipping frozen long, you know, there are many reasons that chemicals are added to food, not just for flavor, but mainly the, the problem to me is that it's, it's all fake, you know, and that we've gotten away from enjoying the natural flavor of natural foods because of this intense flavoring by the food industry. Yep, that's, that's part of the game, sure. MSG, you know, all those types of um, flavorings. Yes. So the question was, what about trying to get at this problem of marketing to kids? And glad you brought that up because it's one of my favorite topics. And the, um, I wound up actually spending about, uh, about, exactly, three chapters in the book talking about children. And partly because it is such an important topic and partly because there is so much activity around it. And one topic I've already talked about is the schools. The other is I've touched on, which is how food companies are pretending to be marketing more responsibly to kids. And then the other chapter is how we can actually go after food marketing in a policy, in an actual policy way, not relying on the food companies to just change their ways. So yes, um, there are uh, groups that are working on this mostly 
um, through Washington, D.C., because so much of the marketing, of course, unlike, say, regulating restaurants at the local level, the marketing is done at the national level, right, with TV shows, Nickelodeon, the SpongeBob insanity, right, SpongeBob on every other food product in the, in the cereal aisle, I mean, in the supermarket, and the Internet. I can't stress enough how food marketing to kids is a whole different world than most people in this room experienced when they were kids or even your kids um, when they were young. Now we have, you know, the 21st century version of food marketing includes the internet and cell phones and all these digital ways that kids are being targeted behind the parents' back. And it's really important to, you know, not blame parents. That's one of the biggest strategies by the food industry on this whole controversy around marketing to kids. Well, it's the parents' fault. You know, the parents are the ones driving their kids to McDonald's, etc. Well, you know, when the um, food companies are directly targeting kids through Nickelodeon, through the Internet, obviously that's a way of getting around that parental control. And so um, what's being done about it? Well, again, it's pretty tough to get anything done at the federal level, but there is an effort also by, I mentioned Senator Tom Harkin, is trying to get two bills, actually. One is to get the USDA to set nutrition standards on competitive foods, this vending machine foods sold through schools. Also, to get the Federal Trade Commission, which is the government agency that regulates advertising, to take up this issue of marketing to kids. The good news is, as, as dismal as the Federal Trade Commission is and has been, there is a current effort to get information from the food industry on how they target kids. And um, by some measures, this is uh, one of the most detailed attempts to get at what is going on, to get at the, the, the marketing data, because the food companies, of course, are the ones that have this information. So there are some efforts wh where they will go, how they will result in any actual changes. It's definitely hard to say, and we're probably a few more years um, away from that, but I'd be happy to um, talk to you later about specific resources to get involved with that. I felt like it was important to kind of paint the bigger picture, and there's frankly no one else really looking at processed foods in general and the deceptive marketing that's going on by corporations. So yes, GMOs are important. They are, to me, um, kind of a symptom of the problem and part of this bigger picture of the industrialized food system. Yes. We're trying to find out where our food is from, especially the whole foods like fruits and vegetables. And we're looking, um, you know, how do we find that information? Where is our food from? And also when you are looking at something that's frozen and it says distributed by and it's like a California company, is there, do they have to tell you if it's a foreign country that's actually making, you know, growing the food? Right. Can you, can you talk about that? Sure. A um, little bit that I know about it. So she's asking about knowing where your food is grown and particularly country of origin labeling. So this has been another kind of hot topic in food policy uh, to get foods to be required to um, have country of origin labeling. A lot of, you know, major players in the food industry don't want that because of your, someone like you who would pick it up and say, gosh, no, I don't want this. And I actually had an uh, interesting experience about this very issue in Maui where I was looking for some dried pineapple to take home with me, hopefully from Maui. Uh, <laughs> So I picked up a package that said, you know, Hawaii on the front. Again, it's again, don't read anything that's on the front of the package. I should have listened to my own advice. So I turned it over, and lo and behold, it said, from Thailand. That was the first package I picked up. The second package also said Hawaii on the front. I turned it over, and it said, um, made in San Leandro, which is up the street from me in California. So, you know, I thought, okay, well, I don't need that because I can get that back home. So, you know, this to me is just an example of the insanity so when you're of... made in San Leandro, does that mean it has to have been grown in San Leandro? Probably not grown. It was probably packaged or distributed or somehow... We can't tell at this point. We don't know where our food is being grown. We can't tell. It's very difficult to know. I mean, there are no... Um, there are very few legal requirements for having especially produce labeled with country of origin. So, but it's definitely an ongoing fight, and there's definitely people that are pushing for it. So it's, you know, it's, not, it's not over yet. So the best bet is to shop in markets. Again, farmer's markets are the best. Next best is a market where they tell you where the food is from, and you know, that's the best we can do for now. I just wanted to caution you on your statement that the farmer's markets are like some kind of perfect place. Okay. Because a lot of those people don't read the labels properly, don't know how to administer their pesticides or, or whatever, or their herbicides or their fertilizers. 
and it is not regulated and it's a really scary deal if you think that's the holy ground. Okay. Well, thank you for that. I come from uh, maybe farmer's market paradise in California where we do have pretty good oversight over the farmers, particularly on the certified organic farmers. It may be a different story here and I'm, I'm learning as I go about the situation here. I just learned earlier today 95% of your produce is shipped in from other parts of the world and that scared me a lot. So um, thank you for that clarification. So um, with that, I will thank you very much. And um, before you clap, I wanted to say that um, my publisher was supposed to send books. And if you ever publish a book, don't go with the publisher. That's all I can say. <laughs> they royally screwed up. But instead, uh, we have a copy, I think, left to show you. And I'd be happy to take orders for books. So with that, you can sign up on my mailing list. I don't put out many emails anymore too busy, but once in a while I'll send out an update where I am and some news reports, etc. So happy to have you sign up on the mailing list and happy to answer um, more questions. And thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much, Vegetarian Society. Thank you all. That was uh, a marvelous lecture by a young lawyer who's on our side and instead of earning a lot of money, she's writing books and doing this research. So everybody knows how we'd appreciate having your chairs folded up and taken to the back. We have refreshments, as announced earlier, from Down to Earth. And that has nicely been prepared by some volunteers. And please come back next month to hear Dr. Bill talk about a raw food diet. Good night, everybody. This program is brought to you by the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii a nonprofit organization dedicated to sharing with the community the many benefits of a vegetarian diet. Free monthly meetings include vegetarian experts found locally and on the mainland, quick and easy cooking demonstrations, and helpful and delicious food samples. Members enjoy an informative quarterly newsletter, social activities, and discounts at many vegetarian-friendly restaurants and health food stores. For an application, call 944-8344. That's 944-8344. Or visit our website, at www.vsh.org. Vsh.org.